This time we are examining Morozovich variation of the Tarash French. We will dissect each move, focusing on key ideas and plans, especially from Black's perspective. After e4, e6, d4, d5, and knight d2, essentially white is aiming for this setup. Both knights and bishops are targeting the king side, while the typical weakness, the d4 pawn, is well supported. Now, this weird development of the bishop, which is the starting point of the Morozovich variation, is actually a clever little move. The point is to wait for white to play knight gf3, which disrupts the idea of knight df3, ruining the ideal setup. At the same time, playing bishop e7 is not just a waste. Later on, the bishop might turn out to be actually well developed. White has several options in this position. e5, c3, bishop d3, and the most natural and already mentioned move, knight gf3. If e5, white is committing too soon. Black should immediately counter with c5, and now c3 doesn't work due to the simple c takes d, queen b6, bishop b4 check, and knight c6, with a good position for black. With the move c3, white is waiting for black's knight to come out to f6 before e5 is played. In addition to that, c3 is known as useful, providing support for d4. Now black can transpose into the Rubinstein variation by trading on e4. However, a more aggressive option would be to play c5. Now knight gf3 doesn't work well, because black can take and push white into a bad version of the IQP position. Pushing e5 gives black a good chance with c takes d, queen b6, and bishop d7, swapping off the bad bishop on the next move. Finally, if white takes on d5, it's fine to recapture with the pawn, but I'd suggest a more aggressive approach taking advantage of the fact that white cannot easily harass the queen while she applies pressure on d4 and g2. For example, after knight gf3, c takes d4, bishop c4, and queen h5, there is another pleasant IQP middle game after c takes d and knight c6, where white's knight is awkwardly sitting on d2. Lastly, the move bishop d3 is met by the same c5. Now, e takes d, queen takes d5 is exerting the same pressure as before, only now the bishop on d3 is a bit misplaced, as it wants to move to c4, kicking the queen away. And the d4 pawn is falling. That's why white usually grabs the c5 pawn instead. We could take the pawn right away with our bishop, but that would make our bishop e7 move pointless. Instead, we aim to use our knight to capture on c5, putting pressure on the d3 bishop. But when we try that, white plays b4, so we need to get some compensation or win the pawn back. First, we push a5. White cannot play c3 because their d3 bishop is hanging, so they play bishop c4. Then queen h5, and after c3, it's important to play knight d5. This move hits c3 and b4. You'll notice that queen b3 doesn't work because of knight takes c3, followed by a skewer, bishop f6. So white takes on d5, and after queen takes d5, black is threatening a2, while planning to play b6 and dismantle white's pawns on the queen side. Plus after b6, putting the bishop on a6 is another headache for white. And now, let's dive into the main move, knight gf3. It should be mentioned that white is not thrilled about playing this move, since the plan was to put the other knight on f3, while this one was supposed to develop on e2. 
For Black, current misplacement of the d2 knight is a success. And now knight f6 may be played. Now e5 comes with a tempo. Knight f d7. Bishop d3. c5, attacking the center. c3. Knight c6. Castles. And white has a couple of ideas in this position. For instance, if queen b6 is played, one plan is to take on c5 to get rid of the weak pawn on d4, then follow up with b4, rook e1, and at some point later advance c4 with a slightly better middle game. The other way is to solidify the d4 pawn, as in case of c takes d, c takes d, queen b6, and knight b3. That's why I really like what Wesley saw did in his game against Daniel Naroditsky, playing the move a5 here. And from this point forward, we are analyzing their game as our model for the Morozovic variation. By the way, this move is not something rarely seen in the French. It serves a couple of purposes. Prevents White's idea of d takes c5 followed by b4. Prepares for c takes d and queen b6, after which White won't have knight b3, thanks to a4. And finally, in certain cases, prepares the idea of b6 and bishop a6 trading off the bad bishop. White is kind of invited to play a2, a4, messing up the b4 square, thinking black has their own weakness on b5. But these weaknesses aren't equal. Black's knight can use the b4 square, while white's is on d2 and cannot just hop over to b5. On the bright side, a4 sets up knight b3, if black takes on d4 and starts an attack on that pawn. But what if black goes straight for queen b6, without trading on d4 first? Then, if white plays knight b3, there is a fork waiting. Indeed, black has no reason to go for c takes d too soon, because it also opens up the c3 square for white's d2 knight to maneuver to b1 and then sneak to the b5 outpost via c3. All this taken into account, looks like queen b6 would have been the correct move for black in case of a4. However, in the game, white opted for rook e1 instead. This move is always useful for white, because it frees up the f1 square, allowing the d2 knight to regroup to the king side and get to the h5 square. Extremely important for white's attack. Second reason for rook e1 is to discourage f6 pawn break. A potential drawback of playing this move is that now the d4 pawn is practically sacrificed after c takes d and queen b6. But before we continue in that direction, there is a rather unusual possibility that you should consider. The crazy looking g5. Although it seems to come out of nowhere, it's not uncommon in the French defense. The idea, of course, is to follow up with g4. If white plays h3, black can persist with h5, aiming for g4 on the next move. However, I would recommend the same move Wesley played, queen b6. Now, if white insists on defending the d-pawn, it would require an awkward move like queen a4. Now with a move like that, and the queen completely misplaced, it's a dream scenario for black to strike with g5. And indeed, black gains a significant advantage after h5 followed by g4. This should be the critical moment of the variation, where white faces two threats, losing the d4 pawn and being harassed on the king side by g5. According to the engine, the best moves are h3 and knight b1. In both cases, white is sacrificing the d-pawn in exchange for activity. h3 is meant to slow down black's potential g5 advance, while knight b1 might seem a bit strange at first, 
But it's actually a pretty natural move as the knight plans to head over to c3 and take control of the powerful b5 square. In the game, though, Naroditsky went for a4. The idea is to secure knight b3 in case black does not immediately take the pawn. Even if black does take it, there is room for the a1 rook to swing over for a kingside attack later. But first knight f3 is the way to go, and the queen's best retreat is to b6. After that, another tempo move, bishop e3. Playing knight c5 in this position might seem awkward, but it's a common theme. Despite being pinned, there is no easy way for white to exploit it. Once again, the move a7-a5 comes in handy, while white's a4 move makes undermining the knight with b4 practically impossible. After bishop b5 check and bishop d7, in another super GM clash played between Arkady Najdic and Francisco Vallejo, we had bishop takes d7, king takes d7, then knight d4, queen b4, queen f3, and a rook h f8, with equal chances. Naroditsky instead played knight e4, and after bishop takes b5, knight takes b5, allowing his opponent to castle, thinking that their king is less safe on the king side than in the center. And then he played queen g4. It looks a bit scary, so black moves away the rook, supporting the pinned knight, and preparing to retreat the bishop to f8 if needed. White plays bishop d4, aiming for knight d6. If black captures with the bishop, and then e takes d6, they will likely have to defend g7 by weakening their dark squares. And another good reason for bishop d4 is the third rank. It is freeing up for one of the white rooks to lift and join the attack on the king side. Well, instead of panicking, Wesley adopted a completely different stance. He simply unpinned his knight, creating threats of his own. One of which is knight takes a4, since the b5 knight would be hanging after. The second threat is knight b3 fork. But what is his idea in case of knight d6, which is almost begging to be played, and has been played by Naroditsky? Well, if black takes and plays g6, white has queen f4, trying to reach h6 or f6. Knight d7 is the only move, followed by e5. But after this sacrifice, knight takes c5 and bishop takes c5, it is over. In case black opts for rook c6, white adds their last inactive piece into action via a3. Wesley had another idea in mind. Knight b3, sacrificing an exchange on c8. Let's delve deeper into this, because initially it doesn't seem like there is any compensation after white defends with rook a d1. The first move that comes to mind is rook c4. But white can attack our knight with rook d3, and suddenly it's difficult to envision a way to exploit their vulnerable pinned bishop. But Wesley found queen c4. This move not only pins the bishop and attacks the a4 pawn, but also protects the knight on b3. White defended the queen with h3, which means, at least for the time being, the bishop is no longer pinned. Now the engine likes the simple solution queen takes pawn on a4, but Wesley kept insisting on the pin, playing h5. Now the queen needs to stay on the fourth rank, defending the bishop. Black responded with queen takes a4, which is an excellent move. Its strength lies not so much in winning the second pawn, but rather in the looming threat of rook c4. Therefore, attempting to unpin with g3 at this point fails, as rook c4 simply wins the bishop. White went on with rook d3, and making room for rook e d1, if needed. Another thing that this move prepares is an unpleasant rook f3. For that reason, the move rook c4 at this point does not work so well, and 
things can get really messy once white puts pressure on f7. Wesley opted for queen b4 instead, with another clever plan. Black is actually threatening to take on d4 and then take on b2, winning the third pawn. This provokes an ugly move, rook b1. Black is now harmonized while white's pieces appear to be scattered randomly across the board. Without any material deficit to worry about, black can afford to play slowly and adopt a more positional approach. That's why rook c7 is played here. White unpinned with an attack on the b3 knight. For the same reason black plays a4 here. And suddenly there is no useful or good move for white to play. Rook c3 gets them in trouble after rook takes c3, pawn takes c3 and queen c4. White opted for bishop c3 instead, and then queen e4. This is freeing up the b pawn with a very interesting final punch prepared in case white trades the queens and goes after the pawn with rook e3. Black goes with b5 first, and if rook takes e4, there is a3. Game over. White realized that a3 is crushing and played rook d1 instead. Then black defends the pawn with rook c4 threatening b4, and there is no good response for white. Narditsky played bishop e1, but there is no reason for black to halt the plan of creating a passed pawn when the timing is right, so he pushed b4. The move also deprives the e3 rook of the c3 square. This vulnerability was exactly what white overlooked when they played rook d7. And Wesley seized the opportunity and played bishop g5. If the rook goes to g3, it gets trapped by bishop f4. And if it goes to e2, the same happens only with knight c1. Without waiting for the grim fate to unfold, white simply resigned. Bishop e7 will definitely surprise most of your opponents. But to really get what's going on in the Morozovic variation, you need to be familiar with most of the other French defense lines. So maybe not the best pick for beginners and intermediate level players.